and welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I am Doug Keck, your host, our special guest author, a talent here on EWTN, an old friend, Father Brian Thomas Beckett Milady, OP. That's a long name, and the title of the book is long as well. It's Grace Explained, How to Receive and Retain God's Most Potent Gift. Always great to see you, Father. Nice to see you. Doug. And, and yes, wonderful work you, you, you've done. Now, this is based on one of the many series you did for yes, EWTN, right? Yes, it is. Right? Yes. Uh, way back in the early 90s. Yeah. Uh -huh. How many series did you do? Because that was the first time I saw you was in the early 90s. And I, have to, I always told you I thought you were one of the best programs and best teachers, which is why I was happy to oh. participate in bringing and getting you back on. Well, um, I think four at that mm -hmm. time. Right, you know? right. And you didn't have much programming then. Right. So one of the problems was I was on like 10 times a week. <laughs> and I exhausted you the, and Bob and Penny Lord. <laughs> that's right, exactly. So I exhausted the, uh, the audience. The, the, yeah, that's why they they decided to let me stay away for a right, while. Give it a rest. Is go on yeah, hiatus. But right. also, you're back on. You're now on. Not even back, but on the radio. Open line. Yes, right, I've been Thursdays. Very, right? very privileged to have a new radio show. Right. Nowadays. We got a great. We call it the heavy hitters. Now we've got right. Trujillo on Monday. Right. Right. And then we've got Father Wade Menezes on Tuesday, My Father student. Mitch, and then, uh, oh, okay, uh, Father Mitch, who's everybody's teacher on Wednesday, and uh -huh. then there's yourself and then Colin Donovan on Friday. So we got a great lineup now. Yes, uh, I've been, like I said, I've been very privileged to do it. So let's talk about Grace Explained, how to receive and retain God's most potent gift. Uh, why can't grace just be experienced? Why does it need to be explained and understood? Uh, well, part of the reason is because people are very confused about what grace involves. And also, I, I do preach parish missions in mm -hmm. parishes, and I talk a lot about grace. Mm -hmm. And what I've discovered is very few people have heard much about grace. They don't, even though it's the center of our religion, they don't really know what it is. They don't understand what our doctrine right. about it is. And um, when you think about it, it's such a marvelous mm -hmm. idea that we actually enter into the mystery of the Holy Trinity while we're on earth and it, of course it's at the basis of spiritual life because what our spiritual life basically mm -hmm. is being transformed internally mm -hmm. so that we can see time from eternity and grace gives us the ability to do that also to prepare for going to heaven of course to see God Right. You talk about it in the book. In the beginning, you say, we're also going to begin by examining the modern errors that make understanding all of this very difficult. The, and what is that? Something about uh, that man is the captain of his own fate, you say. Yeah. Uh, well, ever since the 18th century, there's been a philosophy mm -hmm. that's arisen in Europe that we can solve all our own problems. So the philosophers of the 18th century, the Enlightenment, what I call the Endarkment, <laughs> um, although I just read a book on the Enlightenment that's very interesting. Um, you know, slowly but surely, all the mystery was taken out of the world because people thought science mm -hmm. could eventually resolve all problems. Now, science is a very wonderful thing. We're actually, uh, Judeo-Christian um, philosophy is the only philosophy that allows for science because it has to do with an ordered universe of an, of an ordered creator and laws, things like that. But because of that, people get the idea that we can save ourselves in a sense. Mm -hmm. And for example, with medicine, we, medicine seems to, for many people's idea, have resolved all the problems of the body, even to the point where we can probably resolve the problem of death. Mm -hmm. Well, we've seen how that's been effective in the last year in the world, haven't right, we? Right, absolutely. And even medicine itself, people are so confused. Gee, there really isn't a clear answer on the part of medicine to all these things. So the idea is that the more you feel you don't need, especially mm -hmm. a redeemer, mm -hmm. the less you feel you need grace. And as a result, the less you're interested in the supernatural right. order. Yeah. Well, isn't it true? I mean, it always struck me that in many ways, you know, the teachings of the church go back 2,000 years, and they're, they're pretty well the, the same, might be expressed slightly different. Science has changed totally and continues to change on a regular basis. Right, right. And the original scientists, of course, were quite religious people mm -hmm. in their own way. But someone like Newton, for instance, who was a fairly devout Christian, mm -hmm. But he undercut this, the whole basis for Christianity in a way 
because he believed in these absolutely fixed laws in physics. Right, you say that, right. And as a result, there was no place for miracles. Remember, mm -hmm. they believed that this is the best of all possible worlds, that God couldn't make a better world, and that our world was, in a sense, almost a rival to God. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing that people like Newton thought the creator needed to be around for was to keep the fixed stars and the laws going. But as they began to explain things more and more and more, the less need there was for God. Mm. So after Kant, in the early part of the 19th century, you have especially Protestant thinkers saying things like, uh, a religion without God is just as good as a religion with God. All that matters is that you have feelings of dependency on the universe and you're philanthropic. Right. But the one that you don't need is a redeemer. Mm -hmm. So of course that undercuts the need for Christ too. Right. Well, if you don't, if there's no such thing as sin, what do you need to be redeemed from? Well, and especially original sin. Mm -hmm. I mean, which you spent a lot of time on. Yeah. Here, well, that's right? because it's the one of the most important concepts. Right. I mean, if there's no original sin, then uh, I always like to say, well, more indoor plumbing. Uh, more education, and that one thing we cannot live without today, more meetings, mm. <laughs> will solve the human problem. Well, it doesn't. Right. I thought uh, this was interesting. Uh, I think I'm certainly old enough to remember you say, in the 60s, it was very popular to hang felt banners in churches. Uh, right. Unfortunately, you, you allude that it may still be the case in some places. And you talk about the banner that said, the glory of God is man fully alive, quoting St. Irenaeus. What's the problem with that? Banner? Well, they forgot the second half of the quote. <laughs> the second, it goes, the glory of God is man fully alive. In other words, where all your potencies, your powers that you were created with are, are perfected, but man fully alive is man when he sees God, which can only happen in the next life. So to just put the first half of the quote suggests that a, a humanism based on secular humanism might be adequate to showing whatever you believe God to be. But when you add the second one, you have a very specific person in mind and a person who's absolute, eternal, and to whom you must uh, have direct mm -hmm. access by knowledge in order to finally be a real human being. See, many people make grace like the dessert when actually it's the main course. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it just makes it, it's the Pelagian heresy. Pelagius maintained that all original sin was a bad example and that human beings could perfect themselves virtuously by, on their own, but grace just made it easier to do. Mm -hmm. uh, see, we don't think that. And what is Neo-Pelagianism? Because you talk about that as well. Well, Neo-Pelagianism is uh, the attempt to apply Platonism mm -hmm. to um, a philosophy that is somewhat influenced by Christianity. But again, the second, the word, mm -hmm. so to speak, is somebody created. He's not uncreated. And also there wouldn't be a redeemer mm -hmm. necessary in there either. Right? Do you think there's a certain amount of Pelagianism today that people just think if oh. they do good works or they're, you know, oh, those yeah. kind of things that that's really what matters, period? And Yeah, all that matters is that you're uh, nice. Mm -hmm. Um, right. In but, fact, that was one of your lines you used years ago that I quote all the time. You know, Jesus didn't die on the cross to say, have a nice day. Right, right. right. I mean, the, the new Christianity is that you take Jesus, the crucifix and take Jesus' dying body off and you put a California happy face on there. And instead of I and R I, you write nice on the top of the cross. Right, right, right. But it, you don't have to know anything, see? We, we, you know, we're dealing with at least two generations of uncatechized adults. Mm -hmm. Well, if you ask most people what grace was, it, they couldn't give you any kind of reason. And yet, it's the central idea of our religion. Well, I remember grace was in a blackboard uh, that was your soul. And then you got little dots, which was the, you know, your venial sins. And then if, it got, if you had a mortal sin, it got... But then sanctifying grace, when you went to confession, you get sanctifying grace, grace and the eraser Your would take clean. Your soul is made clean. Clean, basically. Yeah. That was how we saw it as kids. But you also have a plus added to your soul mm -hmm. so that you're, like I say, you can be, as Second Peter 1.4 says, which is the big text, uh, he makes us partakers of God's nature. So we're not just human beings anymore. We can actually enter into communion with God as he is 
which means a loving relationship uh, where we have an exchange of, well, hearts, basically. You make a point, you, you were talking about the Enlightenment and, and the error of the rationalists of the 17th, 18th century, and you talk about uh, Spinoza. What was his point? Well, Spinoza was also a pantheist. Mm -hmm. um, he did believe in, a, in God, but whether the God was a transcendent God, and again, the whole question turns around the need for a redeemer, mm -hmm. is something that they wouldn't have thought was really necessary. Yeah, he said, uh, in a sense, God is made identical with the world. And in some ways today, in this kind of emphasis on the climate change, kinds of related, you know, the globe kind of thing, it seems like, and you referenced kind of the New Age here, which seems like you don't hear New Age anymore because it's gone mainstream. Right, that's true, that's right, true. You know what I mean? The uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, when he was still head of the Doctrine of the Faith, gave an address to European theologians in 1989. And he said that one of the places the Catholic religion is in deep trouble today has to do with what he called the metaphysics of creation, which was his classy academic way of saying that many Catholic teachers teach the world and God are the same thing. Mm -hmm. And you have order sisters communities, for example. I know of one meeting they had in general where they had a procession with incense and candles and sang, but they carried the world in the procession, the globe. Mm -hmm. So there's no transcendent God. And then he said also the third area in which we're in trouble because of this is the afterlife. Mm -hmm. What's described as a, a future that's ideal in the scripture is something we create here by better social structures. Mm -hmm. And then between the two is of course, what's your ideas of Christ? And he said, well, if you're a Christian and you don't believe in a transcendent God, what do you do with Jesus? Well, you either make him a liberator, mm -hmm. like leading armed struggle against unjust social structures. And I thought it was very interesting recently that, remember, all these Catholic religious got all involved in the Nicaraguan Revolution yeah, sure. 30 years ago. Right, right. And now Ortega is a worse dictator than the person they got replaced. Right. right. So they thought, uh, actually, do you know that on the wall someone wrote, blessed is the womb that bore the San Danino Redista revolutionary. Well, what have they got now? Right. Even more tyranny. Right. And the other is more prevalent in our country, which is just to teach us how to have a nice, simple, uh, happy religion, mm -hmm. where again, we're in the happy face business again. Right, well, you're, you, it also gets to the point, I think sometimes with this and reading through your book, uh, the idea that the question comes into people's lives is what does it really matter? I mean, what does it matter whether I live a good life or don't live a good life? It might be nice, but is there some downside to not doing it besides, well, I won't be as happy? Right. Is there something really called hell? And of course. when does anybody actually go there? Right. Well, and again, when Cardinal Ratzer gave this talk about the afterlife, he said he heard a preacher in Germany in the 70s, and I think this is even more true today in mm -hmm. many places. First in the existence of hell, then purgatory, and then finally heaven. And basically suggests we create this on our own. You know, and, and as to hell, people have a very peculiar idea about hell. C.S. Lewis was very good about it, but mm -hmm. hell's basically you saying that you choose yourself and not God. And that's, God says, fine, when you die, if that's what you've chosen, that's what you're left with. Mm -hmm. You're left with yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, nothing more like hell than that, basically. <laughs> yeah. Right, uh, exactly. You also talk about the idea in the beginning here of uh, the idea that we end up with this theology as anthropology culminated in right. Nietzsche, who said that if God is just a projection of ourselves that keeps us from reaching our full potential, why not just get rid of them altogether? Right. So in other words, Nietzsche was the most honest thinker in the 19th century because there was a Protestant uh, thinker, Feuerbach, right. uh, who maintained that theology, that theology was anthropology. So um, basically, we looked at ourselves, what we needed, and we created God from our need. Right. Well, Nietzsche said, well, fine, if I create God, then I'm God, so why put it there anyway? Right. Yeah, we create. It wasn't a God. We were creating God's image. God was creating our image. Was kind of the foil. Yeah, pretty kind much. Of, yeah, kind of uh, you could put idea. it that way. Right. Yeah. Sure. Uh, you say in order to understand the relationship with God and creation, we also need to consider the Trinity. Well, that would be tough because 
understanding or talking about the Trinity has to be one of the most confusing things most people go through in their Catholic faith. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> this has been a crusade of mine for quite some time. Uh, the famous English author who was a Protestant, Dorothy Sayers, who wrote the Lord Peter Wimsey books, she was a, uh, also a, um, uh, the first woman to graduate from Oxford in medieval studies. And she wrote a series of plays based on the Gospels because she came to understand in the 1930s that many Protestants in England didn't have a clue what Christianity taught. And much as Chesterton used to say, people reject Christianity without having any clue what we teach. So one of the questions was, what's the Trinity? Mm -hmm. And the answer was the Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, the whole thing <laughs> incomprehensible. Something made up by theologians that make it hard, nothing to do with daily life and ethics. Mm -hmm. Well, my goodness, if, we, if we're baptized in the name of the Trinity, we make the sign of the cross in the name of the Trinity, we pray in the name of the Trinity, Christ himself came to reveal the Trinity, and we can't say anything about it at all. I mean, I realize it's a mystery, mm -hmm. but still, it's a mystery which we do understand a bit of, mm -hmm. and to whom we have to relate in order to be fully human. I mean, they're our friends. Mm -hmm. Blessed is St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, the Carmelite nun, used to call them mes toi, my three, mm -hmm. because she understood that a person who's transformed by grace experiences the actions of the Holy Trinity, all three of the persons, so they could even d distinguish between them in everyday life. Teresa of Avila used to say the same thing, mm -hmm. that you can experience the Trinity in nature, mm -hmm. the way things grow and move and things, but um, we've lost a lot. Mm -hmm. of our awareness of this, and that right. needs to be recovered. You say throughout the book you explore how grace works in our life to return us to that perfection without the direct personal access to God that Adam had. Right. So what was, it was similar but different for Adam. Yes. Well, first of all, we're supposed to be returned to a communion with God, which Adam certainly had. But you remember that... Um, Adam, like us, has union with God in nature. But as a result of Adam's sin, we have an even more perfect expression of the divine mercy, mm -hmm. and that is Christ. Because there we have human nature united with God in person, not just in nature. Mm -hmm. So that's a greater mercy than even the mercy we've received. And Christ himself returns us to that mercy which Adam would have received before the sin but also now connected to him and in him and through him. Another thing that we pops up that uh, some people would be on, being made in the image and likeness of God, however, makes man special among all the creatures in the world. Oh, I know. Oh, that's not a popular view anymore. There, I know. We're just like animals. With uh, No, the, the, the divine spark in man is, first of all, caused because it's created with a spirit. But when we think about grace, which is a further result of his love, you know, God loves us enough to transform us so that we have communion with him on earth and we'll see him in the face in heaven. I mean, this is our dignity as human beings. And without it, we're not, we don't really have our final dignity. Our final dignity is to be loved by God, uh, to have, right. uh, you know, a relationship of friendship with him. You say it's not possible for human beings to really be human without the vision of God. Therefore, there can be no true secular humanism, which we hear about all the time, because this rules out the divine indwelling of the Holy Trinity. It rules out knowing God as God knows and loving as God loves. And you talk about today, we there's a trend to deny the distinction between the natural and supernatural orders. This causes a problem because grace perfects nature, and so it must not be the same as nature. Right. I mean, if there's no distinction between grace and nature, how can grace perfect nature? And also, because we have an intellect, we cannot be stilled with anything but seeing the direct cause of the world as it is, mm -hmm. namely God. So you have this wonderful thing, I think I quoted it in the book, St. Thomas Aquinas quotes it from St. Augustine, mm -hmm. um, unhappy is the one who does not know you, even if he knows everything else. Unhap happy is the one who knows you even if he knows nothing else. 
and the one who knows you and all the other things isn't any happier for knowing all the other things than he is for knowing you alone. Mm -hmm. That comes from the confessions. And that means because we have an intellect, we can't be fully human, mm -hmm. what we call fully alive, mm -hmm. until we see God in heaven. Right. Our so, hearts are restless. So, so secular humanism really doesn't make it. I mean, it can help you to be good in many ways, but not what's finally in right. the center of yourself. Yeah. What's, what's the remainder concept? Oh, that comes from Karl Rahner. Mm -hmm. Karl Rahner basically thought that you have grace and you have nature. If you, uh, the only reason we're created in a state of grace and have grace as our final purpose is because God zapped it into us when we were created in our mother's womb. But there's no human power that demands the perfection of grace, like I said the intellect did. So if you subtract that out, nature, without order to grace, Rahner said that grace had so changed nature that you had no idea what it was, you couldn't define it. Well, if you can't define one part of the, the distinction, nature, grace, if you can't define this, how can you distinguish it from this? You can't. And so they both become the same thing. Mm -hmm. So that's why after Vatican II, uh, we've had a lot of people, not so much because of Vatican II, but because of certain theologians, who basically don't think there is a transcendent dimension well, for the example of things like the Mass, mm -hmm. I mean, the priest has been reduced from a mediator acting in the name of the Redeemer to a community organizer who just helps people to find the divine in themselves, basically. Mm -hmm. You say it is no more possible for human beings to be satisfied with merely knowing the existence and attributes of God than it would be for an animal to be satisfied with the life of a plant or a plant to be satisfied with the life of a rock. Right. See, um, there was an opinion abroad for many, many centuries in the church that the, you know, we know by our faith that we're supposed to see God. So all these people were very devout Catholics and they knew that, but they didn't know how you could do that without saying that grace had to be given to us in justice, which is a horrendous conclusion, it's a gift. So their solution was to say, well, Adam theoretically could have been created without grace and been happy with only knowing God as the cause of the world. Mm -hmm. But because we know by our faith that that's not enough, mm -hmm. then when Adam was created, he was created in the state of grace. And because he was created in the state of grace, that gave him a different purpose than he would have had without it. But well, see, that makes two natures. Mm -hmm. So it's just the opposite because we have an intellect, we, God in his goodness wants us to be saved. Mm -hmm. So he creates us in the state of grace, Adam, for the sin, so that we can arrive at what our final purpose actually is. Right. But of course that's what we lost in original sin and that's what has to be recovered if we're to truly be right. holy ourselves. And you, you talk about the question people have, well why didn't God fix it right away? Oh I know, I know. Right. Well, the, one of the reasons that is, and, and of course we don't know this for sure, we only surmise by thinking about it what might be the case. Um, the way St. Thomas often puts it is he uses the word convenient. And what he means by that is we don't have any proofs, but there's more goodness we can think of in what God decided to do than in anything we can think of. Well, the idea would be that if the grace had been given immediately after the sin was committed, mm -hmm. the people that committed the sin wouldn't have felt the need for it. But the human race had to be convinced from long failure <laughs> that it couldn't, we couldn't get our act together without grace and therefore long for a redeemer. And then of course there's the companion question, why didn't God wait longer? Mm -hmm. Well, because they might have despaired altogether. So this is the famous idea of the fullness of time present mm -hmm. in St. Paul. You said, why did not God just preserve us in a state of innocence? This was because he wished to show us greater mercy. You right. also said this earlier, and I, indeed, without revelation, without the gift of faith, I would say that we have to conclude scientifically that there's no absolute certainty that Jesus is God. Yeah. Well, uh, we still can't prove it. Mm -hmm. It's something that we believe uh, and again, it's fitting 
that God chose to redeem the human race this way. But as far as a proof, you can't prove these things beyond a shadow of a doubt where they couldn't be questioned. We can think about it a lot. We do know what we believe and don't believe. We have reasonable certainty that this mm. is probably true, but it's not a proof. Because right. for one thing, the incarnation is a mystery shrouded in eternity. Mm. And so the more we understand about it in our faith, the more there is right. to understand. And finally, only when we adopt God's point of view, only when we are reconciled to him and call him our friend and act as a friend would act toward him, can we become friends with the human race again? Sure, we can pass just laws that direct our exterior conduct and maybe keep people from inciting chaos by punishment, but we can't change them interiorly. Right. Interiorly. No, the, right. the, the civil law basically has its purpose trying to implement justice in civil society, but that's primarily judged externally by what you do. It's not judged by the intention of your heart. Whereas the church has, as you know, because mm -hmm. of confession, we have jurisdiction over hearts because of the way the law of Christ in grace is given to us. So even though we can preserve a kind of external justice and peace and tranquility among the citizens, to make us actually one with the rest of the members of the human race, realizing and having union with God our, our Father through the Son and the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential. Absolutely. As is picking this book up, Grace explained how to receive and retain God's most potent gift by Father Brian Thomas Beckett Milady, OP. Thank a you, pleasure Doug. as always. Thank you, Doug. Continue your great work, especially on Open Line Radio. And don't forget, this book is available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com, for all things Catholic. There's a lot in this book. Check it out. We'll see you next time right here on Bookmark.